Welcome to another episode of the Leading Saints podcast. Today, I'm uh, talking with Emma Smith on the other side of the globe in, in the UK. How are you, Emma? I'm very well, thanks, Kurt. Awesome. It's half now past we... nine here, so it's a bit late, but I'm, I'm doing know. well. And it's just another afternoon for me in the United States. So, But I'm so <laughs> glad we found a time to connect. And I must say, we, we got to start, start here. You have the most Latter-day Saint name I've ever heard. I mean, I, uh, what uh, did you get that a lot? I mean, just how cool it is to to be the namesake of a wonderful woman. Well, when I got married, my mum was very happy, and she kept saying, "Emma, it's going to be Emma Smith," because obviously I wasn't Smith first of all, and then I became right. Smith. So um, yeah, and my counselors loved it, and yeah, it's it's a cool <laughs> name to have. It's it is, it is. That's very cool. Um, now, and so, are you born and raised in the church then? So my mum joined um, the church when I was two and a half and yeah and then we kind of went to church and then when I was 14 I decided to leave because we moved house, we moved ward, my mum um, broke up with her husband and I just found it really difficult to go to church to start a new mm. ward even though they were really lovely and the youth were really lovely and slowly but surely I trickled away. And, um, and then I came back another 15 years later. Wow. Wow. And, and now you've sort of been faithful ever since. Yes. So I've been back for nearly 13 years. Oh, wow. That's great. I love to hear those stories. Um, and, uh, what, what city are you in there? So I'm living, um, Buckinghamshire. So I'm at High Wycombe. Um, that's our kind of our nearest ward of where I live. Okay. And where's that in relation to a, like a London or a large okay, metropolitan so area? Win Windsor Castle is like 20 minutes away to okay. drive. Oh, cool. You've heard of Windsor Castle? Of course. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, and you've had opportunity to serve in various places, but uh, you've, you've been, you spent a good amount of time in the Young Women's Organization. Is that right? Yes. So I served as Young Women's President for nearly five years. And now I'm in the stake, um, second counsellor. That's great. I, That's I great. was so, released at December. I was released um, at Christmas time. And then oh, nice. literally a month. And then I was called yeah. again. Nice. And so, I mean, how would you describe, just uh, just speaking generally about your ward or stake, or, I mean, what is it like being a member in in your in your city or in your ward as far as like, you know, how how far are you how, how far are you driving to church or um you know what's the basic demographic and layout there okay so our ward is um about 20 minutes away from where we live and it was quite a small ward um over like the covid times and then afterwards we had um we had some news that we were getting some um church offices built close to where we where we're living and we would kind of count the numbers and there wasn't many people in our ward and we got promised they you know they said look don't worry the numbers are going to come people are going to come and uh and it didn't happen for quite a while and then literally all of a sudden so many like couples families were moving into our ward and it's tripled the size and it's literally amazing um yeah it's it's really exciting to be here at this time and it's very multicultural. There's people from all over the world that's actually like working for the church as well. Oh, so wow. it's, re it's really interesting. Yeah, it's lovely. So like did the church like build like an office type building there or they're yeah. for church employees who, you know, work in the UK for the church? Yeah, exactly that. Wow. Exactly that. And and where it is is kind of um it's called Wooben Green, where it is. And um, when, you know, when we heard it was going to be there, we were like, really, Wooben Green? You know, that's literally down the road. And yeah, it's very special. Well, that's cool. So there's nice. been some nice opportunities for the youth as well, for the young men to, to serve and do car parking duties when they've had like um, general authorities come over and stuff. Oh, wow. And yeah. so that's naturally just drawn more membership into your area as, as people get jobs and things working for the church. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's very, very different going back to a few years ago. Now there's, you know, it's hard to keep up with who's coming, coming in and the names of people. And I've never known it like that. Yeah. So it's exciting. So over your years of serving as a young women's president, on average, like how many young women did you have in your, in your ward? So we had, when I was serving, we had six young women. Um, and while I was there, they really grew up in those 
nearly five years. So I look back on pictures of them and they're these, you know, small little girls that have just joined. And then when they leave, you know, they're serving their missions and going to university. And yeah, that's fun. Yeah, it's lovely. It's really lovely to see them grow and change and develop spiritually and, you know, emotionally. Yeah. So how did you first structure your, your presidency or did you have any advisors helping you out or, you know, teaching classes or those things with, I mean, with six, I mean, there's obviously some girls to engage with and interact with, but it's not a huge or overbearing, you know, task per se. No, absolutely. Um, well, when I was called, to be honest, I was quite shocked. Um, I had, I've had two boys at the time and my littlest was three. Um, my husband's not a member and, I remember the bishop asking me in his office, you know, would I would I like to take on this calling? And I kind of couldn't believe it because I was like, really me? You know, doubting myself. But um, I really wanted to to serve and, I, you know, I really wanted to be able to accept the calling. And I remember phoning my husband at the time and he said, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go for it um, if you want to do that. And uh, I said, well, but the only thing is I'm going to have to be, you know, out every Wednesday night for activities. And he said, yeah, that's fine. I'll have Harley. And yeah, I don't think we realised it would be nearly five years. <laughs> but at yeah. the time, you know, but actually it was the best five years. And then um, I imagine, yeah, it's very special. Yeah. And then yeah. do you remember anything at the beginning, just walking into that calling that role? I mean, as far as finding your footing or where to start or the vision you were sort of putting in place or, or what do you remember just from those beginning weeks of that calling? I remember clearly thinking about my previous young women leaders and thinking how special they were and the lasting, you know, the impact they've had on my life, even though, even when I've not been at church, I still remember clearly the things that we did, the conversations we had, the service projects we did. And I thought if I can be even just a little bit like them, then, you know, I think I would have done well. And I really, really wanted to to do the best that I could and I absolutely took it very seriously I would I, you know it was a big responsibility for me and I wanted to to show the girls that I was willing to to be there the whole time for them and show them love and support them yeah yeah and then in in your part of the world as far I mean do you still do I imagine you still do some type of like girls camp during the during the summer or how, how does that work there we're, we're actually just doing a camp in a couple of weeks that I'm helping um, run and organise. And to be honest, this is one of the first time that I've actually been with the camp. Um, the girls have done been away various times and they haven't been able to do it in the past. Um, and yeah, so it's quite new to me, uh, yeah. camp. But I well, look forward great. to it. And then uh, the typical Wednesday evening uh, activities, those are, are they typically at the church? Is I mean, it sounds like it's in, in, you know, a logical distance of driving to and having activities there. Is that usually what you would do? Yeah. So on a Wednesday, um, the girls would come and the boys, they would come and have seminary first, first hour of seminary. And then afterwards we would have our youth activities and the young women would go into another room and the young men would go and do something else in the cultural hall, basketball or something. Um, and, you know, once every three weeks, we would get together and have a joint activity. Um, yeah. We had a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing those. Yeah. And so do they, do they have early morning seminary there or, or just on no. that Wednesday night or how does that work? They, they do it um, online at home. Oh, okay. But yeah. They, every Wednesday night, that's where they meet. And so Wednesday they're in person doing it since yes. they're going to head to the church anyways, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and then, uh, as, as we do in these, how I lead interviews, I had you send me a few principles that, uh, that, uh, seem to, to be influential in your time as a leader, you know, serving the young women and, um, which one do you want to start with? Uh, I ponder, is that the, the first one you want to jump into? Yeah, I think so. I, um, I would say I'm probably a bit, a bit of a thinker really. Um, uh -huh. and I, I do, I do like to think about things and I ponder a lot, especially in my calling. I really like to take the time to think about the young women and think about their needs and, you know, what, where are they at in their lives? What are they, what are they doing? You know, are they studying for exams? Are they preparing to do something? You know, I really 
what's going on in their world and I really like to think about them and pray for them and really think about what their needs are especially if yeah. they've got exams coming up and things um sometimes it's difficult for them to attend the Wednesday activity so I'd make like these little kind of hampers and you know um if they're studying a kind of revision with a mug and a chocolate and things like that <laughs> yeah that's awesome them. yeah and that's uh, inspiring because oftentimes, you know, I guess almost a cliche answer is, you know, we pray for those that we serve, right? And then young women, you, it makes sense that if a leader was to articulate that, yeah, if, you know, I always include the girls in my prayers, but I love this framing of it that it's not necessarily that you're only praying for them, but you're really taking time to ponder over them and, and create space in your mind for the power of revelation to really take root and to guide you in a path um, that maybe wouldn't necessarily be as obvious if it was simply in the context of a prayer that lasts for a few minutes, right? But more of just constantly keeping them top of mind and having an intentional time of, of pondering over them. Yeah, absolutely. And I do notice the difference, you know, when you have that time and you allow that time and that space to revelation to come and to have the ideas that I wouldn't think of personally. And then, you know, I might do something or say something and it's exactly what they needed at that time. So I kind of realized as I was going along throughout the years that actually the more I did that, the more powerful it became. Mm -hmm. And so I love to do that. I love to, you know, create that space to be able to have that time to think about the individual. And do, are there any stories or experiences that come to mind of uh, maybe something that resulted from taking that time to ponder over uh, those that you served? Yeah, I think sometimes it's not even the, the these big things, you know, it's, it's those little things that really mean a lot. Um, I think building, also building a relationship with the girls as well, like connecting with them if you keep connecting with them, you can help them more, you know? So I think connection was a big, big deal. And if they weren't there, then I would text, speak to their parents, you know, because there was only six of them, you would notice if one wasn't there. Yeah. And and yeah. so I would make it, I'd make a thing like we really missed you. And we generally, generally missed, you know, I generally miss the girls. I love the girls. And if there was one missing, it didn't feel the same without them. You know, so I would text to say, we really miss you. Is there anything that we can do? Or can we give you a ride next week? You know, try and arrange lifts if, if they were struggling with lifts or, you know, just be there for them at the end of the phone, even if they couldn't necessarily attend in person. Yeah. Is there anything else that comes to mind? I mean, if you're coaching maybe a, a new young women president to really connect with those teenagers, come, sometimes it's easier said than done, right? Uh, is there anything that comes to mind that really would help an individual more authentically connect with the girls? Yeah, I think um, finding out their talents quite early on and their interests is really key because then you kind of know what they like and what their interests are. Um, we used to do goal setting and we at the beginning of the year they would make this um, vision board and you know they'd put all their visions and their ideas on it and you could really tell the type of you know girl young women that they would like to be and um that was really interesting seeing their vision boards and uh and i think also if if you know what their talents are, there was one one young lady who um she was really talented and a really wonderful artist. And so on Sundays, we would ask her to scribe on the board and she'd always mm. su do such beautiful pictures and, you know, be able to draw and write beautifully. And she really felt like she was, you know, helping, helping the class. And she loved that standing up and doing it. But also we were so grateful for her. And I think that that was really good because we could connect and we were like, oh, we need you. We need you today. And she'd say, <laughs> yeah, you know, she'd get really excited. So that kind of became her role. And um, yeah, she loved that. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, that really is the sweet spot is obviously we want everybody, you know, especially in our wards or organizations to find places to serve. But when you can carve out a place for people to serve in a place that is in alignment with their talents, like it really is transformational for that individual. They really feel like they're contributing in a way, in, in a unique way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, everyone's got their own talents and their gifts and it's just finding, finding out, speaking to the girls, doing different activities with them as well, because sometimes you find out, wow, you're actually really, really good at this crafting. And sometimes they don't even know that they're, they're really talented at something. So it's, it's interesting and it's, um, it's great yeah. having those experiences with them. And you mentioned the the vision board that you put together. I mean, this I think there's a, a strong principle in that, that oftentimes, especially with maybe those teenage years, you're not going to get a long response out of it when you just ask them, hey, what are some of your interests, right? Um, they may just shrug their shoulders and you wonder why can't, why don't they answer my question, right? But engaging them in an activity like that, where it's almost in a roundabout way, you you discover some of those, uh, some of those interests, then that that's more successful than, you know, just pestering them with questions, right? Yeah, and I think we would do that. We'd kind of do it at the beginning of the year, like in January after the Christmas. So it would become like our news resolutions, but also our visions boards for the year. Um, and it would be, it could be anything to, you know, what they really want to achieve in the year or their school or spiritually. Um, yeah, it's the sky's the limit, you yeah. know, and we'd bring so many magazines and books and kinds of things and we'd ask the release society if they could kind of donate any old magazines and then we'd just spend the night cutting up and making things and um i throughout my calling which i would really recommend to anyone is take lots of pictures as well of your activities and with the girls because what i did i took so many pictures throughout throughout my years and um at the end when i got released i made a little video for the girls and oh, I wow. sent it and yeah, it was lovely to music and you could see how they've grown over the years and all the wonderful things we've done together. And that was really special. Yeah. So pictures, so, I mean, that, that's one thing I'm trying to remember that even as a father, right. As a parent that these, these days won't last forever. And just to take a picture of the, even the simplest of things, uh, you really appreciate it in the future. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's lovely. Great. It's lovely. Any other activities that you did, you know, as you think back over those years, different activities that you did, either that became more of a traditional activity or some that stood out that you thought, wow, that that really turned out better than I ex anticipated. Yeah, we, we had a lot of activities and um, there's a couple of things. I think, you know, it's, there's that fine balance of trying to get the youth to run the activities and them actually happening. Um and then, you know, it, we didn't want to take control of the activities. You know, we wanted them to run, run them. And there was, um, we had car washes that we would do for raising money for camp. And we had activities where we'd have um, Halloween parties and the youth would play games for all the primary. So we'd invite all the primary. And then we had another activity where the youth actually physically made games out of wood. Um, one week and then the following week that we invited the primary and the primary actually played all the games that they made that the youth had hand made out of the wood and they'd carved and they absolutely loved it the the primary children loved loved doing that um we had we had an activity where it was called round the world around the world so we had all the new kind of people that came into our ward um had like we had a carousel and the youth would go around to each you know station and the couple or the person standing there would say about their culture about the country a bit about the church about in their country um and teach them maybe a song and they try food and that was really interesting because they got to kind of experience a little bit about lots of different countries around the world so that was a really good one is yes, yeah, so, because you have a, a very diverse ward, so you might as well learn about their cultures, right, and where they're coming from. Yeah, we had Portugal, we had Ukrainian, we had um, Argentina, we had France, Italy, um, America. Yeah, we had many countries that they visited in one yeah. night. So it's fun. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. And then tell me any any specific routines or approaches for the Sunday meeting, you know, obviously it's every other week uh, that you're with the young women in, you know, the Sunday schedule, anything that comes to mind as far as how you handled that or approach that, anything unique come up there? Um, 
The Sunday lessons, we obviously we only do two a month because there's you know you, two sun two um two young women's lessons, um and I I found that if you give the young women a bit of time to prepare, if they were giving a you know a snippet of the class or they were studying something um, and then maybe text them in the week or just a bit before to say oh just a reminder are you still okay to talk about whatever the topic may be that really helped because it kind of kept them thinking about it as well um, and our Sunday lessons we would try and rotate it so it would be myself and my counsellors would take it in turns in, in teaching and then obviously the young women would lead a part of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then let's see another print to put here and maybe we've touched on these things just naturally mm. in our conversation, but, uh, give time to, to study and pray anything else that we haven't mentioned around that. I, yeah, I definitely would pray for the girls by their name individually. Yeah. Just pop, ponder and pray about the girls yeah. um, throughout the week, you know, not, not just on a Sunday and, and really keep up with it as well really keep up with you know thinking about them um, yeah. as, as the years and the months go on that's great awesome well any other point principle concept that we haven't touched on or story or that we you want to include here before yeah. we wrap up or how'd we do um yeah i do I, I do remember there was once when it was a one wednesday activity and uh a friend of mine had had passed away and i remember thinking i was obviously i was very sad and i i was thinking i i can't do this i can't do this wednesday you know i um i can't really face it but it was a activity where i was going to be driving the young women to um, one of the other counselors houses and i thought i can't let the girls down i've got to you know i've got to come so i I went to the chapel, I picked the girls up and one of my other counsellors in the car. And I was just really, I remember driving thinking, I don't feel right. You know, I don't feel good. I was on edge. I just, uh, yeah, I just felt edgy. I didn't like it. Um, and I sensed that the girls kind of probably thought, is ever okay? And I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done this. And I dropped, I dropped the girls off and my counsellor said, Emma, are you okay? And I, you know, explained what happened and I started to cry. And she said, Emma, don't worry, you sit, you sit here, I'll take the girls into the other counsellor's house. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, girls. And, and they were really sweet. And they said, that's okay, Emma, that's okay. And they got out of the car. And I remember, I went for a walk. And then I got back in the car and I said a prayer and I listened to a conference talk. And I think I probably said another prayer. And I, uh, I spent most of the time in the car. And I remember thinking, okay, I've got to go and see the girls. I really need to go and see the girls. And Obviously, I looked an absolute mess because I'd been crying for, you know, a yeah. good amount of time. And I knocked on my counsellor's door and she said, Emma, aren't we, you know, we're so pleased you came. And she opened the door and she said, oh, I'll show you around my, to where she was living. She was showing me around her flat. I was thinking, oh, this is nice, you know. I couldn't see the girls. And I went in and she showed me everywhere. And then she said, oh, and this is my living room. And we got into the living room and the girls went, Emma, surprise. And the activity that they which I dropped them off to do was going to be playing board games. They spent the time making cards for me. Oh my goodness. And I remember, and this, the, all the lovely words that they put in it. And I remember thinking like, wow, you know, just, I was so surprised and so shocked. That wasn't the activity that they were going to um, this council's house to do. But apparently um, the class president said, girls I think what we need to do is make cards for Emma and um yeah and I, I just I cried <laughs> I was crying more but that was a real touching moment for me because I could have quite easily not ten attended that Wednesday you yeah. know I felt vulnerable I was thinking yeah maybe not not go but actually by going and the girls seeing me be vulnerable was really healthy for them because they were able to serve me and after I was serving them. So it was very special, you know, mourn with those that mourn and, and, and you know, and stand in comfort. And they, they really gave me comfort at that time. And I'll always remember that, always remember that day. Powerful. Wow. I love those stories. Just when, you know, that love is reciprocated, right. And, um, you realize just the difference that you make in the lives of, of these, these young women. It's awesome. 
that's great yeah and I think I think I didn't realize I you know you spend your week Wednesday going in and in the chapel and and I I don't think until until I kind of stepped away and and am now released not you know I got released I didn't ask to be um, released but um yeah now I can look back on those times and think they were hands down the best years of my life without a shadow of a doubt yeah that's awesome yeah well, Emma, the last question I have for you, uh, as you reflect on your time as a leader in, in the Young Women's, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? I am definitely a different person than I was when I, um, before I had my calling in the Young Women's, and taking a calling and accepting a calling is the best thing I could have ever done because it has helped me to learn how to serve people and to show Heavenly Father's love and be an instrument in his hands. And I'm eternally grateful for that. And by doing that, I think my children have had a better mum for it as well. Um, I've definitely learned to be more patient and have more love and the the young women have taught me so many things that I can't really describe in words it just will stay in my heart forever and I think you know the my other counsellors would say the same that those moments they're precious and they just stay with you forever <laughs>